We're about to begin. Um, I encourage you, if you have not gotten pizza, to do so, uh, so we can, uh, you can be nourished both in mind, body, and spirit at this event. That's our aspiration. Uh, my name is Gunther Peck. I'm the director of the Heart Leadership Program, and I really am delighted that you're here uh, for what I know will be a really engaging and I think hopeful conversation about students, about democracy, and about the difference they have made and will make um, in our democracy and in our elections. So um, we are also, I need to give a quick shout out to some, uh, give some thanks. We are delighted to have collaborators and um, uh, other wonderful people across the university and beyond helping us with this event. So uh, we are co-sponsoring this with uh, Paulus. Thank you, Mac. And Deandra, I saw somewhere, there she is, um, our wonderful leaders there. Um, and as I hope many of you know, we had a party to the polls today, uh, and early voting has begun, so no time like the present. But after this meeting, you can, you can figure out voting. We're also um, co-sponsoring, uh, we are helped by the Duke Human Rights Center at, at the Franklin Humanities Institute, um, as well as the Andrew Goodman Foundation. You'll be hearing about them. Uh, who are uh, some of our sponsors, as well as Democracy North Carolina, an organization that has been uh, historically and in the present really fighting for access for rights and citizenship. And most importantly, we are um, working very in close um, collaboration with You Can Vote, a terrific nonprofit in the area that is helping us with what is known as the Carolina Challenge, I guess. Maybe it's got a different name. The NC Campus Challenge, I'm sorry, but it is a, a competition among, if you didn't know, among eight schools, um, of which Duke is one of them, and the goal is to get as many students to vote and to expand re voter registration and voter participation. And uh, we're also thrilled to be uh, hosting a PSA Why Vote competition. If you're interested in that, we will happily let you know about that later. But maybe Kate can say, introduce herself, the director of You Can Vote, who is here with us. Hey everyone, um, I'll just say a couple quick words about the North Carolina Campus Challenge. I'm so excited that um, we partnered with um, Duke and Paulus and the Heart Leadership Program uh, here to get this challenge off the ground and Duke was one of our first sign-on campuses. Um, we have two public, two private, two technical colleges and two um, public, private, technical colleges and HB, two HBCUs. So we have an eight campus challenge that is um, designed to increase and spur civic engagement. And it really starts with education and getting students involved and our community partners involved with making sure people are educated, know their rights this year, get fact-based election information, and are prepared to advocate for themselves and their communities at the polls. So we're excited um, to see who the winner of the Carolina, the, the NC Campus Challenge is. And we're really excited to have everyone here volunteering and coming to learn tonight. And if you would like to get involved, uh, there's going to be a lot of work to do when all of the students come back in the fall. Everyone gets to get registered at their current address and know where to go, when to go, how to vote. Um, and there's just a lot of questions that come up uh, in a presidential election year like this. So we would love to have your help. Rachel's at the table out here. She's our campus coordinator that was working on Duke's campus. Um, and if you have any questions, you can see Rachel. Thank you, thank you, Kate. I should also say that uh, Rachel is working with Duke Can Vote, and which is being coordinated and run by Paulus. So we're collaboration. We don't want duplication. We want everyone to be involved. Um, this is what democracy is. It is an all hands on the deck collaboration. And um, so if you've got ideas, we'd love to hear them. Um, I'm about to show you, uh, before we uh, introduce our wonderful speaker, um, speakers and um, our student moderator, who's gonna be running the show, I do wanna show you a video that um, was made um, recently uh, about a former student of mine, Simone Singleton, who voted and was disfranchised. I think it's important to understand the context of how and why student voting rights are fragile. So we're gonna play it and then we're gonna go right into the program. Um, this was a, an event that we had here two years ago and at NC Central, and you're gonna see audience 
members participating from NC Central where we were uh, not too long ago, and where we were last night, I should say, and had the same conversation at that fabulous campus, and it was really exciting to hear uh, what those good folks um, are thinking. So um, this is our video to give you an idea of a Duke student's voting rights story. today to tell you guys a story and I hope that by the end of it we can uncover some insights and raise some questions about what can occur when the government loses sight of the people it's meant to empower and to serve. My first time voting was in 2014. I was a sophomore here at Duke. So it seemed like a pretty straightforward thing. You register to vote, you go to the polling place, you vote, great, civic duty. So I did, I registered to vote here on campus showed up to my polling place a few weeks later. I showed up in the evening because at the time I was a full-time student and I was also working pretty much full-time. I had heard that there were going to be long lines. I waited in line for about an hour, maybe a little bit longer. When I got to the front of the line, I showed the poll worker my ID. She looked for my name and she couldn't find it. She said I wasn't registered to vote, which I thought was weird because I had definitely registered to vote. So that's exactly what I told her. And she responded, you know, no problem. You can vote provisionally and you'll be good to go. I voted, turned in my ballot, and got my little sticker. I walked out and ran into a professor, Gunther Peck, who was giving students rights home. I told him that I voted provisionally, and that was sort of the end of the conversation. I went home basking in the glory of getting to vote for the very first time. I was really excited about it. A few weeks went by, and then one day after class, Gunther came up to me, and he was sort of somber, and he was like, I, you know, I have to tell you something. Oh no, did I get a bad grade on a test? Like, what did I do? He said, when you told me that you voted provisionally, I felt this sinking feeling in my stomach. So I went to check your voting record and you don't have a voting record. Your vote didn't count. I just remember being confused. I definitely voted. I definitely waited in line and did all the steps the correct way or so I thought. It was really disorienting and, and sort of felt like like stealing away this little coming of age moment for me. It was, it was kind of sad. It didn't count because part of North Carolina's 2013 voter ID bill basically made provisional ballots illegal. It also made same day registration illegal. And I don't think that the poll worker had any sense of being insincere or was trying to be deceptive. It's not her fault and instead more of a statement about the larger institutional issues and legislation decisions that seek to disenfranchise people and to make it more difficult to do this very basic civic duty of voting. It's hard for me to process that as anything but insidious. I can't see any sort of democratic intent about that. My first time voting was indeed a coming of age experience, um, but very different than the one that I expected. But I do know that we have to keep the faith. We have a community here of people who care and centering the narrative around compassion around equitability and around perseverance is really valuable and we can still um, acknowledge and work through the trauma um, that occurs when your government doesn't want to protect you. They wouldn't be persecuting us if we weren't powerful, if we didn't have the ability to really make change. They're scared for a reason. Well, I think the youth photo is important for a few reasons. The first is because it's a constitutional right. Just because people are young doesn't mean that their values or opinions aren't important. They're greatly affected by the legislation that occurs throughout their lifetime, and decisions are being made now in legislation that will affect people who are children now for the entirety of their lives and affect the people that, you know, their children and so on so and so forth. as young people and young minorities and young people of color, you have to get out there and network. I'm going to an event on Monday night. People listen to their community. They'll listen to you. You have a voice. Not everybody who's sort of creating the mainstream media knows about who you value, about people whose voice matters to you. And so some of it is sort of, can be sort of grassroots stuff. And that's the power of social media. You can just sort of share the information and hope that people care. And so staying engaged and just sharing the information that you think is valuable um, is super important. I was in college 50 years, more than 50 years ago. And I started studying political science. I studied political science with the intent of going to law school. And my soft, after my sophomore year, I decided all of the civil rights cases would be decided and there'd be no work for me to do because by the time I got out of law school, it all would be over. 
Well, we are still today fighting the same battles over the same issues, the right to vote. So we have to work where we are. Like you said, it's slow. And by the way, it's not a steady progress up. We make some steps forward and we seem to slide back. So a lesson I learned from my first time voting is that it matters. It's the responsibility of us all to protect that right. This is our country. It's supposed to be equitable. It's not supposed to be an oligarchy decided by a few people. So it's important to stay vigilant. It's important to pay attention. And it's important to keep trying. If we don't, then all that disenfranchisement really worked. Silencing the voices of young people, of black and brown people, worked. And then we don't get a say anymore. I think the country would be worse off. The people that I care about would be worse off if I don't stay engaged. So it's important to me to shape the way the future looks. It's, it's not the government's future, it's mine too. Great. I wish Simone could have been here. She's, um, she's a force, as you can see. Um, so what I'd like to do really quickly is to uh, introduce our student moderator, who um, is going to be asking questions of Yael and um, our guest speaker, and she'll uh, be introducing her as well, uh, and we'll get going. So real quickly, Lauren is a, um, as a teacher, I have to say I have, it is a great job, because you get to know some amazing students in a very short period of time, and I am really feel honored and blessed to have had Lauren take one of my classes where uh, she asked courageous questions literally every single class and um, made us a better community for that, for that honesty and that engagement. I could read parts of her CV, which would be, are just like astounding to me how much she does. And I know it's true of many of you. Um, I, I, I don't want to embarrass you, but uh, she's awesome. Anyway, and she's really perfect for this, this job of asking questions that will push us and the, um, our guest to think about how we solve some key problems. So without further ado, Lauren. Hey y'all, how are y'all? I'm sorry, that's how you know I'm from the South. I said, hey y'all, how are y'all? <laughs> um, so thank you for that introduction. I'm actually going to introduce uh, Yale Bromberg, who has way more of a civil rights and advocacy profile than I do. Um, so she is a constitutional rights attorney with over 15 years of experience in community organizing, advocacy, and campaigns. She is currently Chief Counsel for Voting Rights for the Andrew Goodman Foundation and Principal of the Bromberg Law LLC. She previously worked at Georgetown University's Law Center's Civil Rights Clinic and Voting Rights Institute as a supervising attorney and teaching fellow, where she also received a LLM in advocacy with distinction. Her breaking article and legal call to arms, Youth Voting Rights and the Unfulfilled Promise of the 26th Amendment was recently published in the University of Pennsylvania Journal of Constitutional Law. So if y'all could give a big, warm welcome to her. Thanks, Lauren. You have time, don't worry. <laughs> Just add another 20 years of you. Yeah. <laughs> Take it away? Yeah. Okay. How's everyone doing? It's nice to see everyone, and it's a real honor to be here to help facilitate this conversation. Nationally, everyone knows about North Carolina. So sometimes when you're in the mix of things, you forget the context. Uh, but you guys are notorious. <laughs> um, but also, in a, but there's also a really good story about what happened before the monster law was introduced where North Carolina was at the top of the charts in terms of youth voter engagement um, and voter engagement in general. So this is a really good case study and model about what happens when democracy becomes bankrupted. Um, and I think nationally, it's also a really important case study to understand um, given where we are right now. So I'm gonna just kick things off. Is, can I get this next charge? Okay. Okay. 
So on June 21, 1964, um, three young people, um, James Cheney, Mickey Schroeder, and Andy Goodman, were a part of a Southern pilgrimage. Um, they joined with over 1,000 young people from across the country um, to become a part a, of a movement um, to disrupt Jim Crow and register African American voters in Mississippi. On the first day of their arrival, um, they were abducted by the Ku Klux Klan, basically, and murdered for their efforts. Um, they, the abduction was so serious it took 44 days to discover their bodies and another 41 years to hold the lead perpetrator to account for it due to the white supremacist system in place there, including the deputy sheriff who was involved in this entire fiasco. Um, and their murder really galvanized the country and captured the nation's attention of what was going on in Mississippi. Um, there was obviously a very robust civil rights movement already taking place at the time, um, but when young people were coming in from the north um, that didn't look like the Mississippians necessarily, and there was murders being streamed into living rooms um, across the country, people really started to um, pay attention in a different way about the need for desegregation. Three weeks after their murder, the Civil Rights Act was finally passed into law. It had been languishing, um, so it really helped to establish the kind of like popular will and tipping point to get there. Um, and a year later, civil rights workers again linked arms in Selma, Alabama, Alabama in a voting rights march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, um, this time to call into question the need um, to pass the Voting Rights Act, um, the most important civil rights legislation that this nation has ever enacted um, in, in, uh, in 1965. And when they marched across the bridge, again, the nation was called to pay attention to the violence that was met upon them. And um, you have, this is a picture of Congressman John Lewis, um, who was then the 25-year-old chairman of this uh, student statewide, um, SNCC, the statewide, the Student Nonviolent Coordination Committee. And uh, he, there was so much violence, that there was horses, there were whips, there was tear gas, batons, et cetera. Um, a police officer cracked his skull. And this event was later dubbed Bloody Sunday. And a month later, the Voting Rights Act that had been kind of just sitting around. There was so much protest going on at the time, um, but it was finally introduced. Um, again, this is a story of youth-led resistance. Here's the Reverend Martin Luther King looking very proud <laughs> at the uh, ceremony. And what I think is so powerful about this story is that young people um, were extraordinarily involved in the civil rights movement, the nation's second reconstruction. And we forget that piece of the story a lot of the time. Um, and that really kind of started with this 1960 uh, desegregation sit-in that was led by four very brave freshmen from North Carolina A&T University out of Greensboro. Um, and this inspired a movement of thousands of young people across the South to start to become a part of the sit-in. This is 1960, right? And so this um, started to kick things off into the 60s. And again, this is uh, an example of how young people at the time were so active in all of the various movements of the day, the women's rights movements, Chicano rights, Native American movements, the anti-war movement. Um, and this ground was really kind of made fertile throughout the 60s of this organizing impulse that young people had um, and that the campuses were, became this very kind of um, nurturing space for this type of activity. And finally, in 1971, young people who had been a part of this movement and leading um, major portions of it um, they finally fought for their own franchise and their own right to vote with the ratification of the 26th Amendment. 
And this way, this is in this way, I think of the 26th Amendment as an integral part and natural expansion of the Second Reconstruction. Oftentimes, when we discuss the 26th Amendment, people think of it as an amendment that came around during the fight for Vietnam because there was endless war and there was a mandatory draft. That is all true, um, but that organizing effort would not have been established had it not been for young people across the country already being active on campus um, and understanding the context of how all this stuff was happening, both abroad and then at home. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, my name's Yael. <laughs> my background is in uh, community organizing. I use that to inform um, my approach to litigation and my involvement in advocacy. Um, and to support social justice movements. Um, I am currently chief counsel for voting rights for the Andrew Goodman Foundation. Uh, the Andrew Goodman Foundation is named after Andy Goodman, who was murdered during Freedom Summer. And it's an organization that's on campuses across the country. We're also litigating in the courts around student voting rights. And its mission is to make youth voices and votes a powerful force in democracy. And the way that I came about to this work is from organizing, um, very much kind of a personally um, inspired uh, effort. <laughs> um, I'm an immigrant to this country. I naturalized about six or seven years ago. Um, my mother's for, from the former Soviet Union. Um, my father is from Lithuania. I'm a grandchild of the Holocaust. Um, my ancestors, every generation, suffered persecution. And uh, I was born in Brazil, all of my family lives in Israel, and I was raised in the United States. So when I look at this background and I see the rise of fascism in America today and the normalization of hate and efforts to obstruct rule of law, um, this you know, makes me think of all of these other experiences of what's happened, what has happened and what is happening across the world. So I just wanted to provide a little bit of context for the ways in which I see this obstruction to the ballot affected today. And when I was a community organizer in college, you know, I was astounded by the ways in which access to the ballot for young people, which is the most fundamental <laughs> democratic right in America, um, is just taken away from them. And after doing constitutional litigation for many years on different areas of constitutional law, um, equal protection, gender rights, for free speech, et cetera, I came back to this and I thought, why are we not litigating the 26th Amendment? Why doesn't anybody know about it, right? So before today and maybe before seeing advertisement for this event, who, be honest, who has heard of the 26th Amendment? Okay, that's pretty good. <laughs> maybe I have a self-selecting crowd. Who <laughs> doesn't? <laughs> Um, so this amendment is largely a forgotten amendment. When I usually, when I talk to a, a regular crowd, uh, <laughs> you know, we know about the First Amendment, we know about the Second, the Fourteenth, the Nineteenth for women's suffrage, um, but the Twenty-Sixth Amendment kind of sits there in the abyss, and people have just forgotten about it. And you know what the judiciary has as well um, in the '70s after its ratification. Um, it was ratified in 1971, 70s after its ratification, it went through the state and federal courts all the way up to the Supreme Court. In the 80s, zero litigation, 90s, zero litigation, early 2000s, nothing. It's only after um, the evisceration of the Voting Rights Act through Shelby um, and also the 2008 election, which we saw a sweep of voter suppression bills go across the country, that the 26th Amendment started to be included as a cause of action within lawsuits, but even then it was just slapped on the, at the end of it, and there was no discussion about it itself. So I believe that the reason that we've forgotten about the 26th Amendment and we don't think about youth voting rights within a traditional voting rights framework is because the judiciary has forgotten about it, the people have forgotten about it, and it's just not a, mu a muscle that we've learned to flex. And as a result of that, there's so many opportunities for thinking about um, and deconstructing ways in which access to the ballot for young people um, specifically manifests. And so in 1971, young people finally hit a tipping point because of the mobilization of the campuses. And this is an example of this youth franchise coalition that quickly formed in just six weeks it spread to 300 campuses in all 50 states um, and had 
it was a youth-led movement. Um, and then it had a lot of the national legacy organizations also join on board, many of which are still around today um, to support it. So this is just the kind of like the rapid fire of once you get to a tipping point, what it starts to look like. So what is the 26th Amendment? So um, the first clause of it says that the right to vote shall not be denied or abridged for those over the age of 18 on account of age. It lowered the voting age from 21 to 18, but in addition, it created this anti-discrimination, anti-age discrimination language in accessing the franchise. So we think about it as the Youth Voting Rights Amendment, and that is true, um, but there's very little litigation around that. And I can see a way in which in the future this litigation, this amendment is brought on behalf of elder people, for example, in accessing the ballot as well. Just like the 19th Amendment, um, you know, was on account of sex, right? But then we kind of broadened it out. It wasn't just about women's rights. It was anti-discrimination in terms of sex-based discrimination in general. What's so powerful about this amendment is um, that the nation really came together in rapid fire speed once this tipping point was hit. And just to give a little context, it had been introduced over 150 times in Congress over a 30 year period before it got to this point. Um, sometimes we think that you know, we'll just fight and we'll get there and that's just not the truth of it. We need the popular will, we need the resistance, we need um, efforts that are happening outside of the halls of Congress um, outside of the halls of the judiciary um, to get it pushed. And what's really remarkable about the speed by which the amendment ended up uh, being ratified by the time that it was introduced in 1971 is that the nation really came together. It passed the Senate 94 to 0, um, and the House nearly unanimously 401 to 19, right? It's really hard <laughs> to imagine that type of consensus today. And it rounded Congress and the states, the requisite 38 states, to be ratified in less than 100 days. This is the quickest amendment to be ratified in US history. And because a large part was because of the cross-partisan basis of it. Um, and so one of my hopes for the amendment is that it can be seen as a unifying force, whereas voting rights has become so hyper-polarized and hyper-politicized. I think that there's a lot of potential for age in this, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, some of the folks that really held it up um, in terms of uh, championed the amendment was President Eisenhower, Nixon. Um, Nixon actually signed it during the ceremonial certification uh, for the amendment to come into law. And you know he, held, he said that young people serve a high moral purpose in protecting our democracy because the values of democracy as a nation ebbs and flows and young people would be the protectors of that. Mm. President Nixon. Um, I think we need to remember that cross-partisan history when we talk about youth voting rights. Um, and so going back to why I think that age can really help to bridge a gap in terms of the voting rights jurisprudence, you know, other areas of constitutional law, they're considered suspect classes um, and they're provided heightened scrutiny. And those are areas that are fixed and cannot change. So race, national origin, gender is constructed in that way as well. Um, Age is fixed. We cannot change the age that we are at a present time. But unlike the other suspect classes, age also changes over time. So all people can realize that they were young at some point. And you can talk to anyone across the aisle and they don't want their individual right to vote to be suppressed. So I really think that maybe it's too optimistic, <laughs> but I do think that we can kind of, we, we need to share this cross-partisan history about youth voting rights. And I can tell you a little bit behind the scenes when we're litigating these issues and when we're pushing them forward, it doesn't look good for anyone to be suppressing the youth vote. That does not play to the base the same way other types of dog whistle politics do. Um, so the 26th Amendment is not a standalone right. It's a part of the evolution of the right to vote. Um, and uh, this slide kind of helps us remember that stemming back from the 13th Amendment um, during the first Reconstruction. And the other thing that I think is helpful from 
um, this slide is <clears throat> when you look at the, these are all of the voting rights related amendments. When you look at this, you can see that they're introduced in batches around the nation's reconstructions, right? Um, and in some ways, for example, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, Fair Housing Act of 1968, those are not amendments, but they were new ways in which we interpreted the promises held within the 14th Amendment that went back to 1868. So it took 100 years for us to enact legislation to uphold the 14th Amendment. And I think that this is really the power of um, capitalizing on times of national crisis to push through ratification of new amendments in batches um, and also to reimagine amendments that we've already won and think about the ways in which we can advocate for legislation um, to uphold those promises. And let's be very clear, that advocacy happens in the streets. It doesn't happen within the halls of Congress. So we have to build the popular will around this. So shifting gears for a moment to the way we see this today, um, the unfulfilled promise of the 26th Amendment. Um, there's a myriad of ways in which youth voting rights manifest today that we just are not accustomed to looking at, and they're not researched, and they're not quantified. And even when I was developing my legal scholarship on this topic, I would go and I would present to constitutional professors uh, and litigators, and they would say to me, I never thought about this, and my, my kid is in college, and they came to me and they told me this happened to them and this happened to them, and yes, of course that's a voting rights infringement. Now it's so clear to me that it is, but it just didn't naturally occur to me that that was happening to them because they were young. Um, and so a part of this kind of popular campaign that I'm <laughs> trying to endeavor is for people to understand and popularize the concept of the 26th Amendment so that we remember it. And as soon as we do, we can start to become um, drum majors for social justice and we could call it out when we see it. Um, and I, I do believe that that will start to push eventually the courts um, and the legislatures to understand what this looks like. But that has to happen you know, um, among people, everyday citizens. And before I go into kind of the various specific special burdens, this is language that is from the Senate report that was that sent the amendment um, to ratification. And it sent it to the states for ratification. And what it provides is that forcing young people to undertake special burdens, I want you to remember that language, such as obtaining absentee ballots or traveling to one centralized location in each city in order to exercise their right to vote might well serve to, to dissuade them from participating in that election. And this language goes on to say, and also it can be interpreted as a violation of the intent of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the 14th Amendment. So even though we had these rights baked into the 14th Amendment and baked into the voting rights of 1965 um, and also provided as a 1970 amendment to the Voting Rights Act, which is too long of a story for me to go into here, we still had to circle back and fight for this specific ratification um, with regard to the youth vote. Okay, so special burdens today, and I'm gonna go through this just a bit quickly. Um, the first one I wanna discuss is issues of residency. There's an organized myth that young people don't have the right to vote from their college addresses, um, and therefore they must do extra things to prove their right to vote. In Alabama, we see this. In New Hampshire, we see this. And what that looks like is, for example, an out-of-state student having to come on campus, or maybe an in-state student that's maybe from an urban community or would not otherwise drive, and having to get an in-state driver license or a vehicle registration card in order, in order to prove the right to vote from campus. Um, Keep in mind that in 1979, the Supreme Court upheld students' right to vote from their campus addresses, that was four decades ago. And yet we're seeing these myths being propagated today. There's other ways in which this also manifests, like your financial aid will be threatened, or your parents' tax implications, et cetera, will be upset um, through this process. But that is a violation of the fundamental right of these students to vote. 
The second way, the second type of special burden, is along with the string of voter identification laws that we saw, such as they were workshopped by ALEC, like a small group of folks that pioneered these and started to spread them across the country. Uh, so they all basically had the same language. Just bills that were not written by politicians, <laughs> by elected representatives, um, is uh, strict voter identification laws that specifically impact students. So for example, in Tennessee, um, this is an, in, in Tennessee and in Texas, you actually cannot vote with a student identification card, but in Tennessee, you can, you can vote with, a faculty member can vote with their faculty ID card issued by the same institution, but a student cannot vote with their student ID issued from that institution. And in Texas, you can vote with your handgun license, but you can't vote with your student ID. So let's just remember what the purpose of voter ID is, is that you prove that you, say, that you are who you say you are, and there's nothing else that voter ID is meant to be. Um, so these, these types of restrictions are kind of surgically maneuvered um, to exclude students' access to the ballot. And um, in other states, such as in Wisconsin, they, they allow you to vote using a voter identification, a student voter ID, but the way in which they've maneuvered that law um, is that your student ID can be no more than two years old. So if you're a college student, you have to go back, right? And some people, it takes five, six years. Or even if you're a grad student, you have to keep going back, remember to keep going back every two years to get a new voter identification. Um, I'm litigating that, that case now in Wisconsin. Um, and the, next, the, other, the third form of um, special burden is this issue with, with regard to access to polling places. So why is there not polling places on campuses? Why? It doesn't make sense. The students live there. It's accessible to them. What is the administrative burden of putting them in place? I'm not necessarily advocating that every campus mandates having a polling place. I think that's a hyper-local decision that has to be made. But why are they not more uniformly distributed? just does not make sense. In Florida, the, there was a state policy that outright barred the allowance of treating college campuses as early voting sites. They just said, you just can't do it. On election day, you could, actually. But during the early voting period, when they know that young people are coming out to vote, they said, no, no, you can't do it. So um, Andrew Goodman Foundation, the League of Women Voters of Florida, we sued um, and we overturned that. We won a preliminary injunction that will now be in place for 2020. Um, it was a major win. It was based on a 26th Amendment framework, as is the Wisconsin case, actually, which is in ongoing litigation. And the preliminary injunction we won was in July 2018. So basically, there were three months before the midterm election um, to push for polling places on campus, to advocate for it. It ended up apl applying to 12 locations um, in just three months, which is pretty good. But now we have a lead time to go up to 2020. We hope to see much more of the spread of it across the state. Um, in just those three months, through these 12 new polling places that young people could avail themselves of, 60,000 people participated to vote in those locations. So to put that number into context, because it always helps to have a counterpoint of what that means, um, the statewide senatorial race was decided by 10,000 voters. So it was a sixth of this new expanded base. The statewide gubernatorial race in that race, in that election, um, was decided by approximately 30,000 voters. So it was the equivalent of half of this new voting base. And we hope that leading up to 2020, we'll see much more of this. Um, and it's also helpful because we can, this is a good case study to analyze, you know, from zero to start the impact of spreading these policies. Um, so very quickly, the last two that I'll touch on, and there's so much more room here to study Really, so this is my article really tries to just set a new framework for how we think about these obstructions today, but there's just so much more for us to go into. Um, is campus gerrymanders for local, state, and federal races, how are our representative lines cut up? And how do they cut up through campuses? Um, so 
one of the ways in which to start to study this is kind of related to number three, which is access to polling places. If they're not on campus, then where are they? And if students are being sent to multiple polling places, the chances are that means that there's a gerrymander. But there's been no 26th Amendment gerrymander case ever brought yet. Um, and there's, this is not a robust area of study. And when I say it's not robust, I mean it's like zero. So this is an opportunity for research, and it's an opportunity for um, reconceiving and reconceptualizing how the 26th Amendment could be applied um, to uphold youth voting rights. So this fifth piece with regard to the treatment of provisional ballots, I almost feel like I should reorder these and put this as number one, because the treatment of provisional ballots, we don't really, we just vote provisionally if when we, you know, and at the polls and we assume that that's going to be a safe backstop. And I would never tell somebody not to vote provisionally if that is your backstop you do it, because you don't have another choice. <laughs> and we need to have a paper trail of how these ballots are treated. Um, but the provisional ballot means that you have engaged in the voter process, the election administration process, step by step. And at the end of the day, when you show up at the polling place, for whatever reason, your name is not on the ballot. I've spoken to a ton of young people who have registered to vote. Um, and they show up at their polling place, and for whatever reason, like the young woman we watched earlier on the film, they're, they're just not on the rolls for one reason or another due to clerical error, administrative error, et cetera. Um, and so at the end, they're, they're told to vote provisionally. So when we look at the provisional ballots and the over-reliance of provisional ballots by young people, it helps us to understand the ways in which the other structural pieces failed that particular pool, right? the over-reliance on provisional ballots. In the 2016 race, one in four millennial reported having to vote provisionally. And if you compare that to baby boomers, the number was 6%, and members of the greatest generation was 3%. So there is a radical over-reliance on provisional ballots by young people. That number just means the over-reliance. It doesn't mean whether or not that provisional ballot ended up being treated, being uh, counted at the end of the day. Also another room ripe for research and analysis. And because we don't think about youth voting rights in a traditional voting rights framework, we don't have those type of numbers yet. But there's just so much here. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind, in addition to all of this, uh, which, is kind of like the untold secret about provisional ballots, is that in 22 states, if you cast your provisional ballot in the wrong location for one reason or another, it is completely rejected. It is a full rejected ballot. So when you have young people and campus lines that are cut up, and young people don't are confused as a result of that, and their friend says, "Oh, you're in this storm. Okay, come with me. I'm going to go register. I'm going to go vote. Let's just go to this polling location." And if that polling location doesn't happen to be the one where that your friend is not assigned to, it is possible that your vote will not be counted. Now, is, that, is this, I'm seeing this is like surprising. The reason it's surprising is because there's no notification that's provided to people when their ballots are not counted. Now, my message here is not that you should not be voting provisional ballot, because we need to be able to track this. But we have to understand how this system operates and the over-reliance and likeliness, likelihood that young people's ballots specifically will be thrown away. So this is the exciting part, <laughs> is that we get to craft this jurisprudence and we get to craft a popular education project around this issue to win our rights. And again, times of national crisis allow for us to push through new amendments. Um, you know, I can talk about new amendments, like uh, <laughs> Professor McLean and I are working on an effort to push through a 28th Amendment to overturn Citizens United. Times of national crisis are an, a great opportunity to push through new amendments in batches or to reconceptualize the rights protected in amendments previously ratified into law. And my theory of social change is that with organizing, advocacy, and litigation, this three prongs, that this is actually how we kind of start to get there. And these prongs have to inform each other and not take place in a vacuum. 
why is this important right now? Um, the 2020 election is quickly approaching. The primary is right around the corner. The general election is also around the corner. It's only in nine months. It's going to be here before we know it. That's going to trigger a census, which will trigger a redistricting process. So we have to be vigilant about what that redistricting process looks like for our campus communities. Um, and this also coincides with the 50th anniversary of the 26th Amendment, um, which is a year from July. It's 17 months from now. And so this is a wonderful opportunity to seize the moment of what the history of youth power has provided, what the history of youth-led movements have provided, and recognize that we are in a moment. And why do we not know that the 50th, Amendment of the 50th anniversary of the 26th Amendment is coming up? <laughs> we know that it's the centennial of the 19th Amendment. That's awesome. I'm a big champion of that. Um, but this needs to also be lifted. And it is a great opportunity for us to reflect on the ways in which the promises of the amendment have yet to be fulfilled and how we can start to get there so that we're not you know, at the hundredth, at the centennial, looking back and saying, why are we not there yet? So we know that young people are being silenced and this is really an opportunity for us to start to conceptualize it within a traditional voting rights lens that they're not just some kind of castaway or that we don't think about it in terms of a voting rights framework. Um, and remember that this is going to take a lot of work to get there. Um, but again, the only way that we're going to get there is if we're organizing and we're working in collaboration with each other. These things are not going to happen easily. And I don't want us to kind of, I don't want to paint a picture that, oh, our votes are being suppressed and therefore we should not be voting. No, we should be voting because we know that our votes are being taken away from us for a reason and that young people have always led social justice movements, not just during the second reconstruction, during the first reconstruction. Alexander Hamilton, one of the nation's founders, he was in his early 20s. Um, Alice Paul, was 23 years old when she got involved in the movement for women's suffrage. Um, who else do I have? Frederick Douglass, he was in his early 20s when he made his speech at the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society meeting um, and went on, of course, to pioneer the abolitionist movement. So young people have always been a part of the story of America. Um, and I think that we need to nurture their efforts today as they're leading efforts for gun control, climate change, black lives, and immigrant lives. And we need to marry those movements with access to the ballot as well. That's all I have. OK, so I'm going to ask a few questions before opening it up to the audience. So while I'm asking these questions, try to think of some that you have on your own. Um, so my first question is, in 2018, um, after North Carolina finally voted to levy their restrictions on private colleges' ID cards, um, a Duke student was quoted in the Chronicle saying, as Duke students get used to just carrying around their phone, I don't think the Board of Elections would allow us to use the digital ID as a valid form of identification. So the challenge is that as Duke pushes towards these digital platforms, how do we encourage students to use their real IDs? I think my question is, first, can you discuss, you just touched on briefly, why IDs are needed and to what extent they're needed and why some forms are excluded? And then secondly, do you think that the election board has instead a responsibility to keep up with the growing technology age? And do you think that as we advance towards more technology, that they have a responsibility to keep up in order to encourage younger people to come out and vote? This is a really great question. And um, <clears throat> I believe that eventually our understanding of constitutional rights, spe specifically in the voting rights realm, will have to include expanded access to the franchise. Right now, we don't have that. 
Um, there are many ways in which tech can be used to expand access, which is kind of common sense, such as providing for election day registration or same day registration, online voter registration, automatic voter registration when you go to the DMV that you should automatically be provided the right to vote. Um, that's a, in terms of an uh, opt out policy rather than you have to kind of affirmatively provide it. There are ways in which we can treat expanded tech. Um, there's to me, there's about, uh, I think the latest number, it's about 12 or 13 states that provide for election day registration. I hope that one day we can get the judiciary to understand that if it's possible for states to prove that you are who you say you are and you live where you say you live, at a moment's notice due to the expansion of technology, that those are not decisions that should be left up to legislators, that that is a constitutional right that should be read within the state and the federal constitution. That is a constitutional right. We need to adapt our constitutional analysis to keep up with evolving technology. If I call my insurance company, they know everything on me instantaneously. But somehow we can't use this tech to uphold the right to vote. Um, now I say this with the caveat that online voting is not the direction that we need to go in. And that's proven, proved because of hacking and we need paper-based systems for voting machines, et cetera. So we need a smart way to use technology that is trackable. Um, but going back to your specific question around student voter identification, it is unfathomable to me why student IDs are not uniformly used. Um, and, and for example, the example I gave for Tennessee that a faculty ID card is used but not a student ID issued from the same university. And in most states, or I don't know if I can say in most states, but in many states, student IDs are not included at all. And then when they are, it's like the Wisconsin law, right, where it's, they're only two years old. Yeah. Okay, so kind of deviating away from, I guess, student access to the ballot, 27% um, of Durham, Durham residents have either less than a high school diploma or a GDE or just a high school diploma. So how do we ensure that this demographic obtains the same rights guaranteed to them by the 26th Amendment if they're not enrolled in a university or college program, given that a lot of tactics to expand young voter turnout are based on those programs? So how do we make sure that it's not a right guaranteed just by students in academia? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so when we when a lot of my my work so far has focused on students as a proxy for youth when we talk about access to the ballot within a 26 amendment framework, there's so much more here to look at, like the impact of the criminal justice system on young people specifically. There's ways in which we can overlay these these analyses and start to explore them. Um, but I think that, there's also, for example, in the Monster Law, um, one of the provisions of the Monster Law that they cut was a very popular pre-registration program to pre-register 16 and 17 year olds in the high schools. And actually it was such a great program, it brought the county registrars into the high schools as well to be a part of a kind of fusion civics program. And that provision was so popular, first of all, that they cut it, but when you look at the numbers, <laughs> but when you look at the numbers, in just three years, it registered 160,000 16 and 17 year olds. And now it is, that law is back on the books. Um, and the latest statistics that I saw on that is that 39% um, of eligible high schoolers are pre-registered to vote. So I think that we need to continue to nurture what that program is supposed to provide for and do a lot of outreach on the high school level um, and nurturing civics and voter registration within a civics curriculum itself. The studies show that voting is habit forming and that the earlier you vote, the more likely you are to do next time and as you grow older. And that just makes sense because you know, you know, you go to the polling station and now you understand the, the process and it's less um, abstract. Okay, so another question that I have is in June of 2019, um, I remember being like on the Hill and hearing about when the Supreme Court found that North Carolina's partisan gerrymandering was indeed not 
unconstitutional, um, despite the common cause evidence and um, saying that it would give an ex like uh, advantage to non-Hispanic whites and Republicans. Um, but we know that it's also a common tactic to split up college campuses, as you said, to gain political advantage. Um, and in Duke's last midterm election, students couldn't vote on campus. Um, some students had to vote at different po polling locations, which was very conf confusing for a lot of students. Um, so do you think that if we use the 26th Amendment that maybe the Supreme Court would see um, the importance of ruling against gerrymandering and ensuring that we uphold our democracy? Yeah, I think that in many ways the 26th Amendment gives us a lens to think about um, the rights that were afforded through the 14th Amendment um, and through evolution of the right to vote, but specifically applied for young people. And we haven't, like I said, we haven't had a gerrymander case come up yet that's focused on the 26th Amendment that's really examining the impact on the local level. Um, and, and a part of that is also looking at the various kind of layers of the onion of how this impacts young people, if it's voter ID, if it's um, the like, location of the polling stations, if it's the myths that are propagated about your right to vote. It's almost like it's a scatter shot that young people just, they're so confused, they don't know what to do, they're sent in a million directions, sometimes they're given the wrong information, and that can be very disempowering, you know? But there is a power to movements, and there is a power to us working together to try to solve that problem and see it as an opportunity for growth. Yeah. Um, and so that's what I'm hoping. Like I said, the, the amendment hasn't really been litigated in recent history. We have the Florida presidential case that we won. We have now in Wisconsin that's starting to percolate. I do believe that with um, the increase of youth turnout in 2018, for example, young people voted on, at unprecedented rates. So we're going to see more and more engagement. And we're also going to see different ways in which suppression manifests. So just <clears throat> to give an example of the increase in youth voting, which is all statistics and polls are showing that it's on track to be just as unprecedented in 2020. Um, and anyone who's paying attention to what's going on today <laughs> intuitively knows that as well. We don't need to look at the polls to, to show that. Um, but in the 2018 race, young voting doubled in the midterm election. And in some states, it increased anywhere from 7 to 20 percentage points. Um, which really changes the outcome of races. It's, a, it's an elective, election determinative um, uh, demographic. And, and the numbers that I provided for Florida are an example of that. I don't know if I gave the numbers for Wisconsin and the voter ID law that we're fighting, but the voter ID piece is so important because young people will have their student IDs with them no matter what, compared to other IDs. And then in Wisconsin, just as an example, through the public schools and the colleges, there's 300,000 young people who now, a lot of them can't use their student IDs to vote. Um, but remember that in the 2018 race, Wisconsin was decided by less than 23,000 votes. So young people really have an, an, an opportunity to change elections and to have a significant impact. So building upon that, and this is my last question, and I'll shut up and let y'all answer, ask yours. Um, but how do you think that, I guess given the history that you presented, like right before Congressman Elijah Cummings died, like I remember him looking at the cohort of interns I was with on the Hill, and he was like saying to us, like, I know that you're looking at all these problems and you're looking up to us thinking that we're the ones to solve them, but we're really depending upon you. And I was sitting in my chair like, <laughs> Yikes. Um, so how do you think that students and young people, despite all this widening partisanness that's happening, can come together and demand that parties fight for things that are important to them? Um, and given that our generation is increasingly independent, do you see this as a dividing force or a unifying force? I think it's a unifying force. I think that the history of the 26th Amendment bears out this cross-partisan basis. Um, and that in addition to that, young people are, are eschewing traditional party affiliations. They're increasingly independent voters. And so we have to kind of demand, as young people, a seat at the table. Um, and that is the only way we're going to do that is if we're actually voting. 
that otherwise the decisions are going to be made for us. And we are the ones that we've been waiting for. <laughs> Young people have always been at the forefront of movements for social change and justice. Um, and the nation's history shows that. And we have to just continue to remember that because there's so much negativity that's thrown at us. That, And I say us because I am um, the last year of the millennial <laughs> generation. Um, so I, I include myself. Um, but, but we are, we are the people that we've been waiting for. And the, the youth base is only going to continue to be increasingly diverse and increasingly independent. And so at some point, regardless, the numbers will hit a tipping point. Um, for example, if you look at the voting rates of baby boomers and, and older, um, they vote, well, let me put it this way. In the 2016 and 2018 race, was the first time that the age demographics for those below the baby boomers became a larger part of um, the electorate compared to the baby boomers plus, right? So now everyone below baby boomer, we are a part of the majority of the voting electorate, but we don't vote at the same rates. So baby boomers plus vote at 64% of their demographic, and everyone below them votes at 46% of their demographic. When you chew those numbers up, what that tells you is that if we were to vote at the same rate, that that would be an increase of 43 million new voters, okay? Now, if you look at the average electoral margin in the last five presidential elections, is it five? Well, the last, yeah, five presidential elections since 2000, the average electoral margin is something like 5.3 million. So, um, so we have, I wanna make sure that I have that number right. It was, oh, I took it out of here. <sighs> That's so annoying. No, it was 43 million. It was 43 million compared to 5.3. So we have the power, we have the potential, we just need to get out there. So given that, I know that you all know that early voting has started. Um, in addition, I work in the career office and there's always um, registration up there. People from You Can Vote are here, so if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to them. Um, but I'll run around with this microphone if anyone has any. Hi, I'm Mila. Um, something that has been really sitting with me heavy, heavily as we head into this presidential election is how people are talking about people who didn't vote in the last election, um, kind of thinking about like blaming and guilting people. And I'm just wondering, like, what would you recommend when trying to empower people? But also, I mean, it, there's something to be said about blaming people for who didn't <laughs> vote, definitely. But that's not, in my opinion, the best way to try and get them to change their actions. And so what kind of things would you recommend saying or speaking to people about? Yeah, so I'm really glad that you asked that question, actually, because we can look at um, voter suppression and we could look at the flood of money in politics and kind of analyze the problem from that perspective, but about half of the base, of the voter eligible base, did not turn out, roughly half. And so we need to, I'm invoking Stacey Abrams' call to action to overwhelm the system. We need to just go and vote. We don't have an option. I think that the last election is a really great example of what happens when people don't vote, that they determine the outcome of elections as well. And it depends on who I'm talking to and what their particular um, area of interest is, for example, but you know everyone focuses on like the high-level races, like president or you know Congress. Sometimes they focus on it. Oftentimes they don't know what's going on down the ballot. Those elections are actually so critically important on a local level that people just don't know it. So I would encourage telling them about it. For example, if you are in a, I, I'm not sure about like specific local politics in North Carolina, but I know that you have elections for the judiciary. Um, if you have elections for the district attorney's office, they have the prosecutorial discretion in cases to decide um, how people should be um, prosecuted and potentially criminalized. Um, 
the freeholder races, if that applies in North Carolina, they're the ones, nobody like knows what these are, but they're the ones that determine whether or not to accept money for detention centers from the federal government um, that would end up going generally to private uh, prison contractors. And so these are decisions that are made on a more local level that I think that when people think about just whether or not their vote counts on a presidential election, they might think, oh, I'm just one vote, et cetera. But a lot of these votes, I have, I, have, I have clients, I have candidates that run, and they win by like four votes, right? By, by how we treat the provisional ballots, it ends up going to the provisionals, right? These are election outcome, outcome determinative races, um, and they are really important on a local level. So I just tell the people that are not voting that they basically effectively are voting for the status quo if they're not participating in the system. I'm also really glad you said that because 95 elections in North Carolina in I think 2016 were decided by five votes. Mm. So once again. <laughs> Hello, I'm Emma. Thank you for coming here to speak tonight. Um, and I think during the presentation, you mentioned something about like coalition building or like the overlap between like voting rights for women and voting rights for people of color um, and not voting discrimination based on age. I was curious if you do anything with like disability rights or if there's any overlap or coalition, coalition building with like disability rights for people being able to vote. You should have to give me a little context, Emma, for what do you mean by civility rights? Okay. Oh, disability rights. Yeah, there's a great um, disability rights, voting rights community um, that uh, is active, that look at ways in which we need to make sure that um, people with differently abled people in general, regardless of what that means, um, that studies election administration specifically for the disabled. Um, and so they really look at it. It's not uh, an area that I, specifically can claim an expertise in, but I do know that they're very strong um, and they are involved in this. And I know that even in terms of, um, there's a Bard campus, which is a private school in upstate New York, not too far from New York City. Um, their polling place is like 500 square feet. And so the ability to navigate that polling place, if you're a, if a differently abled person, makes it extraordinarily difficult. Um, nevertheless, you know, um, like for everyone else, for a 500 square feet area. Um, so I do think that there are ways in which we can like start to analyze and expand um, access to the ballot for, for differently abled people. Um, and I think it depends on the personal situation. Like there might be more reliance on ops, absentee balloting, for example, um, depending on uh, what that particular person is dealing with. Any other students before we have faculty? Okay. You can tell I'm not a student. Here, go to the yeah. chair. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, my name is Magdalena. I was curious, are there any recent um, laws that have passed about student voting that really give you hope for the future? Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, I think that we need to develop a gold standard federal bill. I really believe in that. Um, even if we don't think that it's going to pass, I'd like to kind of develop one. But when we look at certain measures like election day registration, for example, that disproportionately um, impacts young people and young voters and boosts youth turnout. Um, so I would really look to measures like that, like election day registration, the pre-registration program that's in North Carolina that I think maybe needs more support too, um, that's now back on the books. Uh, that's a really great model as well. And there's a, there's a program that's being piloted out of California, which I love, which I would love to see more expanded on, um, where it's almost com it's so common sense, you wonder why we don't already have it, <laughs> that when young people, so California permits for online voter registration, and when young people go to re-register every semester for their classes, they're automatically provided an opportunity to register online to vote. It's like common sense. This is also going back to the prior question about access to technology. Um, I think that that's a really great model. Um, but again, there's no silver bullet, for example, for online voter registration. 
it means that it generally means that you have to have an in-state driver license in order to register online. So you're not going to capture the entire universe, but that's why we need kind of like a gold standard multi-prong approach to this as well. I was um, noting the data that you showed about the um, bipartisan support for the amendment. It's kind of stunning to, yeah. at, at this day, this day and age. And I don't think Congress would agree that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west at those levels. Um, but I think there was something different then too. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the data would show that youth in the 70s were much more conservative, much more conservative than they are now. And though you're right that uh, youth are increasingly independent, they're also increasingly liberal. Uh, look at Bernie Sanders, 51% of the youth vote in New Hampshire. Uh, I think the data is pretty clear on that. So I guess my point is there's a reason for all of this. There's a reason in 1970 that there was bipartisanship because I think maybe both parties felt that it wouldn't hurt them. And there's a clear reason today why one party is suppressing youth voting because of the nature of youth um, partisan, not partisanship, but ideology. Is that fair? I haven't studied the, it's an, I, I would be interested to see what the kind of um, political makeup of the students in the 70s were and compare that to today. It's an interesting question. Um, but what I find is that when we're talking about state bills, maybe, but we don't have student identification cards universally provided in terms of a form of ID in general, even in blue states. And when we talk about access to polling stations and where polling stations are located, that also happens in blue states and it also happens in blue districts. Um, and so I think that the fear is that young people will uh, disrupt the status quo regardless of party affiliation and that that, and because I'm, I understand the partis where we see partisanship today on this, and I cannot deny that. Um, but I also see it happening across the aisle. And I think that it's because um, there's a fear that young people will upset the system and upset the status quo. And I think that the way that we overcome that, um, and people may have certain feelings about this, is by remembering why the amendment was ratified. And that's why I love talking about the Nixon quote that young people serve a high moral purpose because the nation's values always undergo ebb and flows, that the young people are supposed to provide a moral compass. And therefore, if we are living in a, in a democracy, that young people are critical to making sure that the dem democratic process is upheld. And again, I see that happening across, part across partisan lines. The issue of the Bard campus, for example, is in upstate New York, right? Um, so. Yeah, thank you for your question. Hey, my name's Toby. Um, I have a, just a quick question. Um, for a lot of people on this college campus, this is the first time they're gonna be voting in a major election, anyone, anywhere between 18 and 21 years old. And for a lot of people, they're not actually even from North Carolina. So there's a lot of uh, like, discourage, like discouraging factors for people to get involved in North Carolina politics. So what do we, what do we say to those people who really feel that they have no place um, getting involved in politics in North Carolina, or if they wanna get involved in politics back home, since this might be new to them, how do we get them involved in that too? Yeah, so thanks Toby. Um, like the Supreme Court decided in 1979, they upheld uh, a case that came out of Prairie View, uh, A&M University, uh, that young people do have the right to vote from their college campuses. So if they want to vote from campus, they have a fundamental right to do so. Um, if they want to vote from where they're from originally, like their parents' address, because they believe that they're going to be returning to that address, et cetera, they also have the right to vote from there. They don't have the right to vote from two places, um, but they can vote from one or from the other. And what I would say to that is, because the question also touches on um, another question that I often get asked, which is why should students have the right to vote from their college addresses if they're gonna live there for four or five years, right? Like they'll, you know, they're coming in, they're outsiders, et cetera. Um, so the, it's the same question that you're providing, but it's kind of flipped from a counter narrative. Um, and, and my argument is, is that on the local level, when you come to school, 
there are certain things that you're going to be availing yourselves of and certain rights that you're going to want to be able to have, like access to affordable housing, um, you know, um, access to a women's, woman's right to the autonomy of their body. Um, there are certain things that you're going to want to avail yourself of. Um, access to financial aid, potentially, depending on what your particular circumstances. Um, and so, and your, ta your tuition rates are going into the tax base of the state, and your rent is going into the tax base on the local level. So you are paying into a system that should be protecting you. And if you're not voting in that system because somebody's taking it away, or you're taking it away from yourself, um, then you're being taxed without being represented. And that's fundamentally anti-American. So just a, a quick point here, this is such a rich discussion, I just wanted to add a comparative dimension, and I have some students from a class here, so forgive me for being redundant, but I cannot get off this figure. The United States now is 138th of 172 democracies in the modern world in our participation. So this is the context in which we're talking about this. We are failing terribly, and the reason things are going so badly in the country, I believe, is there are many reasons for that, but, but at base, there is not participation, and people are being actively discouraged, particularly young people, from participation. So I think if we see that, we can really understand things in a much clearer way, because I think the people who are promoting voter suppression have done a very good job of marketing um, photo ID and all these things and making it sound so normal. But when you put it in that context, that here's a country that we pride ourselves on being the modern world's first constitutional republic based on we the people, et cetera, and we're 138th of 172? I mean, that should be a cause for national embarrassment. So we should be doing everything we can to do things like auto, you know, same day registration, boosting youth voting, the high school programs, and all these other things. So I love this discussion. I hope people people are going to get involved uh, in this effort. But really, I think we should do it not least out of like some pride that we should be doing a whole lot better in participation than we are. We'll take one last question. I, I can just ask. OK. Thank you for that comment. I appreciate it. So I, I hold on just one second. Oh, do we need the mic? OK. Um, so, um, I was born in India, but I'm a US citizen now. And going off of your point and your earlier question, uh, or your earlier point about access um, um, and you know, having a federal, uh, a federal gold standard around accessibility, uh, is there, are there any guidelines at the federal level on how close a polling station ought to be or uh, what the you know, uh, a minimum, maximum of wait times, those sorts of issues? Uh, so for example, uh, in India, which is the largest democracy in the world, uh, uh, you, uh, it's uh, constitutionally mandated that a polling station cannot be any more, uh, any further away than two kilometers. Um, I don't know if a, any such similar thing exists here in the United States, so I was just curious to That's find so out. That's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, we don't have that. We don't have that. Um, and I will have to make a note to include that <laughs> when we draft the gold standard bill. Um, no, we don't have that in terms of polling place. Polling place accessibility is really kind of baked into the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the way that we interpret it. And after um, the Shelby decision, which was a Supreme Court decision that basically eviscerated a major portion of that law, states have been able to just move forward. And so we've seen unprecedented closures of polling places um, as a result of that. Um, so we're moving in the opposite direction right now. But I do believe that when we study history, that we see that we are in a national crisis right now, if it's around rule of law or access to the ballot or you know whatever area that we want to look at, we can see in all of the ways in which we're just at a democratic crisis right now. And this is an opportunity. We have to look at it as an opportunity, and we need to vote and make sure we know who we're voting for down the line um, and take advantage of it and reimagine re what we want. This is an opportunity to, re to dream.
Yeah, I definitely agree. Thank you all so much for your very important, intriguing questions. This is not a conversation that ends here. Um, definitely take this conversation out anywhere you go. Um, I like to think that like, even if I'm speaking to one person, that's one vote I could potentially you know, encourage. Um, so with that, um, we're gonna have Tyler Edwards um, wrap up and he's the executive director for Democracy North Carolina. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Not the executive director, but you can clarify. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Tyler Walker. I'm the executive coordinator with Democracy NC. And uh, come down here. So um, thank you all for this presentation. This has been amazing. Um, if you guys would indulge me, I'd like to just tell you one story. Uh, hopefully, it'll drive the point home on the value of your vote, on the value of democracy, and also just the value of this work. So back when I was younger, maybe high school or uh, middle school, my family and I had a very, very defining moment. We were huddled together in the living room of our small apartment, making a decision about whether or not to pay for hot water or for lights for the third month in a row. I don't know if anybody's ever experienced that, but if you have, it is a extremely humiliating and frustrating experience. And on paper, it wasn't the type of thing that was supposed to be happening to us. I mean, my mom and dad, they started their own business. They both worked two jobs. They were members of the PTA. My dad was a Marine. He was an immigrant. And they're the kindest people you'll meet, the first people to extend their hand out to help you when you needed it. And yet, and yet, there we were, deciding between hot water and lights for the third month in a row. Now, to me, there is no clearer sign of a system that isn't serving the people it was meant to serve. I mean, <laughs> there's no clearer sign that something's wrong when good, hardworking Americans, no, good, hardworking people are struggling just to get by. So my dad, sensing my frustration, he pulls me aside, he sits me down, and he tells me some very important things. The first thing he tells me is that if you are not at the table, you are on the plate. The next thing he tells me is that good things don't just happen to good people, they happen when good people make them happen. Mm -hmm. The last thing he told me was that you cannot advance your station in this life without representation in this government. And I knew exactly what he was trying to get across to me. What he was trying to explain to me was that because we were black people in a government that historically underrepresented black and brown people, we were suffering. But there was another thing he was also trying to tell me, something a little bit more hopeful. He was trying to explain to me that if I really really wanted something to change, if I wanted things to be better, that I couldn't wait around for somebody else to do the right thing. I couldn't expect somebody to come help me. Mm -hmm. No, I had to stand up and I had to take back the power given to us in this democracy. And that's, that's the key, democracy. You see, democracy is the great equalizer. All things are laid flat before the vote, from presidents, to billionaires, to PTA members, and college students. Everyone, everyone is equal in the ballot box. And I know, I know, it's easier said than done. You watch the news, you come to rooms like this, you hear presentations where you find out all of these barriers between you and your rights. But I'm, I'm not worried. I'm not worried, and the truth is, for the reason why I'm not worried is that I have faith in you. Yes, you and you and you and you. I have faith in you. I have this faith because I understand something that maybe some of you might not know about yourselves just yet. I know that you are leaders. I know that you are the true leaders of this country, not in some distant future, not when you get older, not when you take that job down the line, but right now, in this time, right now, right now, 
right now with your voice, with your vote, you are the most powerful group in this entire nation. I know that to be true. And if you don't believe me, there is only one clear sign, it's one clear point of evidence. You did a whole presentation on it. <laughs> They've been trying to take your power away from you since the dawn. They don't want you to exercise what they know you're capable of. Now I know, taking back your rights in this democracy is going to require a little bit more than tuning in to one election, a little bit more than voting on one issue. It's going to require some level of commitment, commitment to time, energy, and passion. So that's why today I'm calling on you, not just to be a voter who votes for voting rights, but to be a leader who leads others to protect voting rights. I'm calling on you to join, to, to, to organize and volunteer with organizations like Democracy NC, like Our Vote Matters, like You Can Vote. I'm calling on you to drag your friend, your cousin, your friend's mother's sister in that order, drag them to the polls and make your voice heard. This will require some level of commitment, some expectation of struggle. But your vote is worth more than your weight in gold. And your future is what's hanging in the balance. So I'm going to tell you all right now, like my father told me, if you are not at the table, you are on the plate. If you want good things to happen to good people, you have to make them happen. And if you want to change your status in this life, you have to have representation in this government. So go vote. Go vote, good God, please go vote and drag every single person you've ever met to the polls with you. Thank you all very much. Right <laughs> wow. So, um, Tyler, thank you so much. That was awesome. Um, let me just quickly thank uh, uh, the awesome uh, colleagues I have in the Heart Leadership Program, Lalita Kalagatla, who is uh, doing a terrific job. Thank you. Uh, Adam Beyer, thank you so much, Adam. Beth Austin, for really doing the work to make this uh, conversation happen. And, um, and also, Yael and Lauren, if you want to continue the conversation, please come down. And uh, I won't even try to top what Tyler said, uh, but just to say, you do know what you can do, and you find out by doing. And democracy is a thing, it's really a verb. And uh, if you know that, you're gonna join an incredibly interesting and awesome and exciting cohort of people who will make this place a better place. So thanks so much.